Uh, I'm delighted to be here and uh, be uh, sharing this, uh, this story with you, but also uh, reconnecting with uh, someone I knew a long time ago and has taken quite a different path than, uh, than I took. Um, this is a real celebration, in a sense. I view it that way uh, because uh, David has had an enormous uh, influence on our world. Uh, a lot of places, I think, would uh, deride uh, a capitalist who has made a fortune, as David has uh, in this life, but uh, this is not that kind of place. I think the <laughs> idolizing people who uh, deliver value to the world is a hugely important cultural phenomenon. Uh, in her book uh, about a bourgeoisie, Deidre McCloskey uh, said, uh, the attitude towards markets and improvement is central Imagine an ancient Rome in which everyone was fascinated by gadgets, in which work by hand or abacus was viewed as honorable, in which the occupiers of aristocratic status and other non-working positions were commonly portrayed as stupid and lazy, in which engineers and inventors were heroes, in which millionaires had heroic biographies written about them. You'd be imagining a Rome that would have had an industrial revolution. Ditto with somewhat different list of counterfactuals for Song China or the Abbasid Caliphate. But instead, the great Hellenistic engineer Archimedes declared, the work of an engineer that ministers to the needs of life is ignoble and vulgar. Uh, Deng Xiaoping's version of this was, to get rich is glorious. And uh, David, I think, is a great example of this uh, phenomenon. He has created billions of dollars of value for our world, and uh, we're here to hear all about it, and uh, as one of my colleagues described, how you can become uh, him. So with that, <laughs> let me welcome David Sachs. So uh, you did not follow the traditional University of Chicago Law School uh, career. Right. Uh, you're not a partner at a law firm. You're not an academic toiling around. Um, before you came to law school, was this in your mind, entrepreneur, or did you imagine something completely different? Well, uh, well first of all, thanks for, thanks for having me here. Um, you know, I guess when I came to law school, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. And um, I graduated college in 1994. And law school was the default path for smart people or people who are just good at school who didn't know what else to do with their lives. And Does that uh, sound familiar to some <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maybe that's still true today. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, um, you know, I, I did have a sense that I wanted to do business rather than law, um, but, um, but I wasn't quite sure how to do that, you know, and... Um, I wasn't, I wasn't even sure how to sort of be an entrepreneur or anything like that. So um, w what happened was uh, when I graduated from law school, I actually interviewed, um, so I spent a summer at a law firm and kind of confirmed that that in fact was not what I wanted to do. And there's nothing wrong with, with being a lawyer. What did you but not like about it? Well, um, you know, I think there's nothing wrong with, with, uh, with wanting to be a lawyer, um, and there's plenty of great jobs within the, the legal world. Um, for me, I think that there was just something about, you know, if you're a lawyer, uh, a law firm, you're working for clients. And somehow I preferred to be the client ultimately making the business decision as opposed to sort of the person ad advising. There's just something about that that just, um, fundamentally seemed, seemed um, be better for me. Um, even though, you know, the law was, you know, really interesting intellectually and I uh, enjoyed that and I really enjoyed my time here at the school. Um, and so I, I felt like, you know, I wanted to figure out how to get to the other side of the table and I didn't quite know how to do that. So I interviewed at uh, McKinsey, you know, management consulting firm, which, um, it's structured a lot like a law firm, but um, it's the, the advice is um, sort of a more business or management nature as opposed to, to law. And um, so I ended up getting a job there after, uh, after going to school here. And, um, and then just a few months into that, a friend of mine from who I'd gone to undergrad with, um, Peter Thiel, called me up and was telling me about a startup he was doing in 
in Silicon Valley, and um, that company eventually became PayPal. And I, I quit my job at McKinsey after about nine or ten months, and uh, I went to to go join that. And um, you know, I there was you know this was in 1999, so it was this was before the whole dot com crash, and it was a really exciting. That, that was sort of a it was a very exciting time for the internet, and um, you know, I kind of thought I had missed the whole thing. You know, I graduated here in. 98 and um, you know I, by that point you know companies like Amazon and eBay and you know Yahoo were all taking off and there was something about it you know I, and I had been at Stanford in, in the early 90s and um, and I had all, it was, you, the, the people who had graduated actually one year after me I graduated like 95 or 96 I was hearing stories about how they had kind of gotten into it, but in a way, because I graduated a little too early, I thought I had missed the whole thing. And then when I you know, got called up um, uh, by a friend, it was sort of an opportunity to kind of get into it. So tell me about risk. So mm -hmm. you know, I was similarly, so we graduated the same right. year. Uh, I went to a law firm. I eventually worked at McKinsey. Right. Uh, someone calls me up at McKinsey and says, you know, I'm a college buddy. I've started this company nobody's ever heard of. You want to right. come work here? Right. And this is the difference. This is, you know, professor, uh, successful <laughs> entrepreneur. I say, are you kidding me? Right? <laughs> I've got to eat. Uh, uh, right. Risk is something. So, so I guess one question is like, is it just kind of inherent? Can you learn to, to uh, tolerate risk? Um, I know for a lot of our students here, probably that's something they're, they would be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Do you have to try it out? Can you learn it? Um, what mm -hmm. were your attitudes towards risk? Right. Well, um, so the it wasn't just one conversation. The conversation happened over a number of months. And, um, and actually, the idea, as it was originally pitched to me, was um, the, the original idea for PayPal was to be money from one Palm Pilot to another. <laughs> I don't know if anyone here. <laughs> Anyone here remembers like a Palm Pilot? This was the original smartphone. Yeah. Anyway, it's like it doesn't exist anymore. But um, there, there's something like five million Palm Pilots in the world. And so, you know, what I said to Peter was, "This actually is like one of the dumbest ideas I've ever heard of. Like, why would anyone ever use this?" And but over the course of several months, uh, the conversation shifted to, well, "What if people could email money?" And I said, okay, that's a killer idea. If, if, if that's what we're gonna do, I'll quit my job tomorrow to go do that. So a big part of it was being enamored with that idea. And then also, you know, I went over, I took a trip to Silicon Valley to, to go see what was happening. And um, there was just a sense uh, at that time that it was just a very exciting place to be. And that even if this particular company didn't work out, you'd still be in a better position to do the next tech company or tech startup. And so this idea that, you know, like what, what were you actually risking, I guess, would be, you know, you know you, it's not like you're not getting paid a salary, so you're, 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 you're going to be able to eat. And, um, you know, you're not risking your career um, because if this particular one doesn't, start, uh, doesn't work out, you'll still get enough experience to be able to do the next one. And so, I thought, I actually didn't see that much downside, is, is the answer. There's a to real the confidence, though, in yourself, mm -hmm. right? So you say, I don't see a downside. I mean, some people could internalize failure or not be right. confident that even if this fails, right. I go into something else. I think, right. you know, learning to, f I mean, your career has been marked by a series of successes, but there are lots of right. people like you who've, who had big failures in the, in the midst. Right. So I think the thing you have to get comfortable with is the idea that there's not like a track. So there's not like, you know, um, with the law, if you go work for a law firm, you know, there's, you're going to be an associate for a certain number of years and you become a partner and senior partner. And so everything's very mapped out. And, and that's actually true for all professional services. You want to be an investment banker or even a management consultant. You know where, if things are going reasonably well, you know exactly where you're going to be in your career in 10 years. And you probably know what the salary is going to be and, and all this sort of stuff. It's a lot like school, right? I mean, yeah. you, know, you, know, you know, if you're in seventh grade, you know you're going to be in 12th grade in five years. Like, there's no, so, um, but um, doing entrepreneurial stuff is not like that. You really have no idea where you're going to be. Um, and it's more like, um, 
don't know, somebody hands you a machete and puts a rainforest in front of you and it's like, okay, go. And um, for me, like, I, I found that part exciting. So to me, there was something, um, uh, the idea of being on any track, uh, whether it was law firm, McKinsey, Goldman Sachs, whatever, uh, no matter how big the pot of gold was at the end of sort of once you get to the senior, you know, grand poobah or whatever, like, I still didn't want to do it. You know? Stifling to you. I, yeah, even if I knew for sure that I was one, after 20 years, was going to be like, in, you know, achieve the highest whatever, um, I still wouldn't do it because it's just, for me, uh, it was just, there's something just um, not as exciting as, um, as not knowing. So I think that's the element of risk is that you have to be comfortable with, um, with uh, not being on a track. Um, now, that being said, I don't think the risk is you're not going to eat or, um, you know, or that you're going to be branded a failure or anything like that because I just think, um, you know, the, the, one of the great things about our startup culture is that, you know, hey, if it doesn't work, you just brush yourself off, you know, get up, go do the next one. It's, it's not like you go to debtor's prison or something like that. It's, um, so, so I think, I'm, I'm not even sure like risk is exactly the, the right thing that you have to be comfortable with, I guess. Yeah, I mean. It's, it, more, it's more about ambiguity, I think. It's like, how do you feel about ambiguity? Um, if you're somebody who doesn't like working in uh, a world of ambiguity, you're not gonna like doing startups. Because there's risk in, in staying in a law firm, right? Right. Uh, there's, the, there's risk on both sides of these equations. So, so you go to right. pay. And you, know, you could join a big company and you, you, you think it's very safe and then it turns out to be Enron or, or yeah. uh, you know, whatever it is. And then, so I, I, to me, it's, it's, about, it's about that question about um, do you, uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty. How do you, and how do you perform under conditions of uncertainty? There's a lot of people who don't like it I mean, I can tell you when you're in these startups, um, you only have a fraction, things are moving very fast and you only have a very limited amount of information. So you're always making decisions under extreme uncertainty and you're making lots of them. And if you freeze up, if you're the type of person who freezes up under those conditions or says that, look, I need 90% of the data before I can make a decision, you're not gonna do well in that. If you're somebody who's kind of likes to rely more on gut instinct and is you know thrilled if you can get fifty percent of the data and just you know, and if you're wrong, you'll fix it later. Then that's it's 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 more of a mindset thing, I think. So so you go to PayPal and uh, we obviously know that turns out to be a huge success. You're the what COO of PayPal. So give us the the sort of thumbnail sketch of that experience. What was the kind of thing, the biggest life lesson you learned for then going on to the other things that you've you've done to take away from your PayPal experience? Uh, well, there are, there are a whole bunch of them, I guess. Okay. Um, so just a few months after I joined PayPal, we had the whole dot-com crash. So, uh, you know, every, it, it, um, the whole world sort of changed and um, you know, companies started going out of business left and right. Um, at that point, I think our company was burning about $10 million a month and we had about $40 million in the bank. And so, uh, and no customers. Well, we had a lot of users. Okay. So the, we had we had been very very successful at getting millions and millions of users. We had bootstrapped ourselves <laughs> off of eBay. So you know all the eBay sellers and, and buyers were using PayPal, but we didn't have a business model, and um, we had some vague notions of of a business model, and. Um, for the, for the lawyers in the room yeah. who have no idea what that means, what does that mean? Oh, well, business model is just a way to make make money. Okay, how to monetize all these people? Yeah, PayPal was, was a was a free service, and I think we had branded it as always free, and um, uh, and so we weren't charging anyone, and so um, and every transaction cost us money because we had to pay the credit card companies uh, for whenever a, a credit card payment got made. And so when you're losing money in every transaction, you can't make it up on volume, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, we just, we iterated very, very quickly. We ultimately instituted transaction fees. Um, we, uh, we kind of kept our promise in the sense that um, 
we had always reserved the right to charge businesses for fees. So we basically defined what a business was, and um, we kept some of the consumer usage free, but then we shifted fees onto all the, the business transactions, and we kind of turned things around. Um, but um, I think the, the, the thing that, um, I think the thing that I took away from PayPal that we were able to use at Yammer was, you know, at PayPal, um, you know, we raised something like $300 million and uh, almost went broke. It was a very, it was not this like lean startup operation. It was very much a swing for the fences type thing. And so when I did Yammer, um, what we tried to do was, you know, we raised money every year. We tried to get as big as we could as soon as we could. It wasn't like this um, very lean model where it's just a few, got, you know, a few people in the garage tinkering. And as soon as we knew we had something that was kind of working, we tried to put as much gasoline on the fire as we could. Was that a, was that a mistake? Was that a, no, I think it worked I, out. I think it was the right thing to do because I think the, um, the, the, the bigger risk, so I basically saw two risks, right? One is that uh, you're going 100 miles an hour and you hit a wall and then the company goes bankrupt. But the other risk was that, um, was that bigger companies would copy what we were doing. And we started to notice once we, so this is after an initial product launch and people seem to be liking our product, that uh, there are a lot of big companies that got super interested in what we were doing. And so had we not decided to sort of um, bulk up, I don't think we would have competed as well with, uh, against them as, as we subsequently did. Um, so what was uh, your biggest mistake you guys made at PayPal? At PayPal? Um, you know, it's, it's really hard biggest to second guess these that things. You, that you made. Oh, you know, that I, I mean, you're made? COO, right. you're making all these decisions. What was your biggest screw up and what did you learn from that? Um, well, um, I remember that very early on we um, needed to do, we, we, we thought we needed to do a, like a marketing campaign and um, we hired um, Scotty from um, you know, Star, Star Trek because <laughs> you know, the, the, the beaming money idea. Forrest Whitaker, no, Forrest, what's, uh, yeah, whoever yeah. it was, yeah. Um, <laughs> De, De, uh, DeForest, uh, yeah. No, it was, um, uh, I think Forrest it was James, Kelly? James, James Doohan, I think. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, maybe I'm thinking of the yeah. doctor, yeah, okay. I mean, he's, he's a guy, he's like, guy, beam yeah. me up Scotty, yeah, he was yeah. like Scotty, so, because um, we were still on this like beaming idea. And so we threw a big press conference and then no one came and it was sort of <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, as it turns out, that was only about a $100,000 mistake, which sounds like it might be a big mistake, but it turns out we made many million dollar mistakes later on. So um, I, uh, this is how I justify, you know, to, to Peter to this day is that was like, you know, um, we ended up making multi-million dollar mistakes later. So you you yeah. uh, you successfully mm -hmm. uh, build PayPal. You right. sell it to eBay. Right. And then you leave being an entrepreneur of the technical kind mm -hmm. and go to Hollywood to become a different kind of entrepreneur. Uh, I was telling David on the walk over here. I was sitting in the front row, uh, and I, I I sort of knew vaguely what he was doing as our lives were proceeding in parallel. Mm -hmm. And then I was sitting in the front row of a movie theater uh, here at the River East Theater in Chicago with my in-laws uh, on the opening night of a movie called Thank You for Smoking. And it popped up on the screen, a David O. Sachs production. And I spent the rest of the movie <laughs> thinking, is that my David O. Sachs? Is that <laughs> Could it possibly be? The movie's got kind of a libertarianish edge. It's possible, but what the hell would he be doing making movies? So what the hell right. were you doing making movies? A great movie, two right. golden, <laughs> two Golden Globe nominations. Yeah. A great movie, but what 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 were you thinking? Well, it was a different kind of startup, um, and um, you know, after we sold PayPal, I was looking to do something new, and I'd always liked movies, and um, I watched a lot of them, especially you know, third year of law school, <laughs> um, and. Uh, and you know, I felt like somebody, yeah, I should be able to make a better one. And, um, and so, you know, it really was like a startup where I spent three years, uh, you know, figuring out how the movie business worked. And, and this is a book this you movie. loved or? Yeah, it was a great book. And then we adapted it to a, into a screenplay and, um, you know, hired. Were you hired just the money or were you intimately involved in? No, I produced it. We were the money, but we also um, produced it and, you know, hired all the actors and the crew and everybody else. And, um, 
I then took the, the movie to a couple of film festivals and sold it to, to Fox. And um, I think it cost about $8 million to make, and it grossed about $35 million at the box office. And um, I mean, it, it did, you know, it did we, we got nominated for a couple of Golden Globes. Yeah. And you declared victory and then never made another one. Yeah. So I'm assuming that something about that experience, because that's kind of a home run scenario. Your first right. movie, critically acclaimed. Right. A great, if you haven't seen it, it's a great movie. You should go watch it. Right. Um, and then you never made another one. Well, what I, happened? Well, after spending a few years in Hollywood, I um, started to become uh, nostalgic for the relative sanity of Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just the impact you can. So, I mean, when I look back at it, um, you compare PayPal to Think of Your Smoking. I mean, they're both successful, but, um, and they both took about the same amount of time, which was about three or four years. But the impact you can have with a tech company, you can reach, you know, billions of people. Um, and um, and so just the, the scale, the impact is just I think so much greater with technology right now. So I decided to go back and do another tech startup. Now I read somewhere that uh, there was features of the culture in Hollywood that also were difficult, right. like the I think the line I saw was something like I could start an internet company in the time it takes people to return my phone calls or something like that. That's true. I mean, I mean was it yeah. were you? Were you shunned as because you were an outsider, or is it just endemic to the way that the culture there operates, or what was the... No, I mean, I wasn't shunned at all, actually. Um, if you're willing to write... They like people with money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you're willing to write a check in Hollywood, it's amazing <laughs> how many people will uh, want to be in business with you. I mean, it's a little um, bit like, um, you know, the uh, World Series of Poker, where if you're willing to, to, uh, to pay the buy-in, you can pretty much play with the best players in the world. Yeah. Um, but the, the issue is just... Um, the, the thing that, that's frustrating about it, and the reason why it's so slow, is because you don't really control your own destiny, right? So you're waiting for a lot of other people to get back to you, for their schedules to align. Um, you know, everyone's a contractor. You know, whereas when you're doing a startup, everyone works at the company. That's their full-time job. Um, it's sort of, you know, the employee-agent uh, distinction, you know? and um, things just move way faster in tech. And so, yeah, I mean, basically, I felt like while I was waiting for people to call me back, I could have been doing another startup because it's just that much slower. So then, uh, then you start uh, Genie. No, uh, you start, uh, was it called Genie? Genie, yeah. Genie, yeah, which is sort of an ancestry site, which you then sell, and, and Yammer, which uh, you sold to Microsoft, which is a huge success. Um, you've described to me separately the kind of culture of Silicon Valley and the, the uh, the way that ideas get funded. I think it'd be interesting to hear, I think the students would be interested in hearing the perspective of the difference between the traditional sort of R&D model and, right. the, and the, the current model in Silicon Valley. So right. your story, you go to TechCrunch, you pitch this idea to a bunch of people, you win a prize, they give you some money, right. and it turns into a billion dollars. Right. Can you walk us through the process and the culture that is Silicon Valley and what you think is so great about it? Right. <coughs> well, I just think the... Um, I mean, what's great about it is the opportunity that somebody uh, with nothing but an idea um, can raise the capital <coughs> they need and um, come together with other uh, like-minded people to create something. And we, you know, we were talking about how <coughs> maybe 40 years ago, the model for innovation was more of this big company R&D model. You have like Bell Labs or something like that where they set aside you know, billions of dollars for R&D and a small group within the company might try to seek funding for their project. Now that model has been completely blown up and those same inventors, entrepreneurs would go to VC firms. First of all, they wouldn't be part of a big company. They might leave a big company. And they would go to Sand Hill Road, which is a road in Silicon Valley where there's like 100 VC firms on the same street. It's like really amazing. And you just go from one to the next until uh, somebody gives you a term sheet to, f to raise money. And so you still end up owning <coughs> you know, most of the company. And then they're, they're your investor partners. And, um, and then you go off and try to build this thing. And you know, most of them fail, but some of them become really, really big, big companies. Um, and so I, I think what's happened is there's sort of this, um, looking at the, the biggest picture, we've kind of replaced um, R&D with venture capital and then some M&A. 
So like, I, you know, personally, I think it'd be more efficient if all these big companies just cancel their like research departments and replace them with M&A departments because small teams of entrepreneurs funded by VCs are able to make progress so much faster than you know, a small team inside a big company that's struggling to get recognition and resources. So, uh, and, and if people have questions, I mean, I have a lot more that I can ask, but I'm, I'm eager to hear from you all, all right. too. So if people have questions, we can sprinkle some of those in here as well. Uh, just raise your hand, and I can call on you, put you in a queue. Um, uh, so let, let's talk about law school. I mean, do you, do you regret going to law school, or do you think it was a good move, or would you do it again? Would you play it out the same way, or? Um, I, don't, I don't regret it. I mean, I, I don't really regret any any of the steps that it kind of took me to, um, to where I am. Um, and actually, I enjoyed it. I thought, it, um, you know, I, I never s somehow felt like I had like a first rate academic experience at my previous school, and I felt like I really got that here. Um, and like I said, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and so it was sort of the, um, it was sort of the next step in, in the path. Um, would I do it today? I mean, I, I think, it's so much easier now to, um, if you want to do technology, there's so many more resources. It's become more tracked, actually. You know, th there's uh, these programs like Y Combinator where it's like a, I think it's like a four-week course where you'll go there with your idea and they'll help you incubate it and things like that. So um, today, I think it'd be a tougher question just because I think there's more um, That path is easier. Yeah, yeah it's easier. Um, if you, if you ever watched the movie um, Jobs, um, so Ashton Kutcher did this um, portrayal. He actually did a pretty good job portraying Steve Jobs. And um, it depicts the early days of, of Apple where he and uh, Wozniak got it off the ground. And um, this one of the very, very early VCs, Mike Markula, comes to his house. And so they kind of haggle over uh, their first VC deal. and. Uh, you know, Marco is like, okay, I'm going to give you ninety thousand dollars for one third of the company, and you know, they were all like high fiving each other, you know, because it was so hard. You know, they showed Steve was on the phone calling hundreds of people to try and get money. It was so hard to 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 um, to basically get a company like that off the ground, and now it's just infinitely easier. It's just there's um, so many more resources, so much more capital. Um, you know, there's blogs you can read, um, uh, there's programs you can go to. So I, I think there's just many more um, entry points. So for most, I mean, try as they might, mm -hmm. most people in the audience will not have your success. Uh, <laughs> partially because of uh, circumstances, also partially because they may not be dispositionally inclined to be as risk-taking or, or love ambiguity or whatever the key features you right. described are. So for the people here who are going to be lawyers and mm -hmm. think of themselves as lawyers, right. uh, it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on what you've seen. You've worked a lot with lawyers. What are the kind of characteristics or attributes that distinguish excellent lawyers to mm -hmm. you in your capacity as the, as the client right. uh, from the bad ones? Right. Well, um, and so, so I'm, I'm generally working with business lawyers. Um, you know, uh, knock on wood, I haven't had to work with any litigators. Uh, just because I've, you know, so far I've managed never to be sued. Um, you know, what, what I would say, you know, great business lawyers help you get things done, which sounds really obvious, but um, I guess the way it's different than you might think is that, um, you know, when you graduate from law school, you spent probably 20 years of your life in school, and things are like, things revolve around standardized testing. And there's no standardized test for life. And um, so it's not about proving how smart you are. It's really about, um, it, it's really about, um, again, just trying to facilitate a business outcome. You know, what I see, like what I would describe as like a bad lawyer is somebody who is kind of nitpicking things they're, they're trying to like prove that they're adding value by taking things down like a more academic path than we have to go or they're sort of nitpicking things in a way that slows things down. Now look, you have to um, 
you have to avoid making mistakes. I mean, that's like critical. It's, you know, that's obviously a very important part of the job. And you have to really know your stuff, and you have to alert the client to risk and make sure that they're not doing anything you know, stupid or, you know, God forbid, illegal <coughs> or something like that. But it's really about trying to, um, uh, trying to implement the, um, the, the client's wishes in terms of getting something done as opposed to proving how smart you are proving how smart you are or trying to add value like I, you know I've seen I've seen um, deal negotiations where um, where the lawyers in the drafting rather than simply just uh, creating language that implements the intent of the parties will try to get like a one up for their client by saying, oh, gee, hey, the other side, you know, they didn't notice that the way we drafted this means that we're gonna get, the, like, that is not helpful. Like, yeah. I would prefer a lawyer who just raises that issue and say, look, we could draft it that way, but I think what, like, both sides are trying to say is this. Way more helpful. You know, it's actually not helpful to try and get unbargained for uh, advantages in, in a deal, I feel. That's, That's not the way I wanna do business. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a v super interesting point. And there's been some recent cases that talk about this kind mm -hmm. of uh, lawyering advantage taking. Mm -hmm. But that's a crucial thing. Because yeah. I, I would think most lawyers mm -hmm. think like, oh, I'm zealously representing my right. client's interest. And that is to, within the boundaries of the law, whatever, to pull the wool over the side of the opposition right. as most as best we can. Yeah, I'm on Team David. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. on that team. Like, like, where can we get an edge on them that, you know, um, it's, it's not helpful because the, um, the business relationship is not the contract. You know, this is simply a, a framework of understanding for if the relationship's gonna work for something that goes on a long time in the future. And it's really better for both sides never to be surprised and, and for you to simply, you know, again, give intent or memorialize the under, or help flush out the mutual understanding of the parties. Um, the other thing I'll say about that is, uh, and this goes back to kind of lawyers trying to prove that they can add value or how smart they are, it's way better to use form documents whenever you can. Like novelty <laughs> in legal documents <laughs> is a really bad thing. It just wastes everybody's time. It, co it costs the client more because, you know, now, you know. That's the whole point, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it really drives me crazy. Um, now, th there, there, are, there are businesses where, uh, where legal innovation or legal novelty can truly add value, um, like tax or things like that, where like, you come with a new structure, yeah. like, you might create a lot of value. But for the type of business that I do, um, I always just want things that are off the shelf as much as possible, yeah. you know, because, um, so take like a deal financing, you know, a, or, or company formation. You know, if you put something in there that's non-standard, every single future investor in the company is gonna look at that and they're gonna catch it. And they're gonna say, wait a second, why is that in there? And now we have to explain to every future investor why we did something yeah. different. And that just creates a lot of drag on, on us, you know? Um, and you can see there, I mean, just to, I don't want to make this academic, but you can see right. there a uh, uh, private value, but maybe a social cost that mm -hmm. this inhibits innovation in law because this is the way the business people think. Right. And so everybody just incorporates in Delaware and goes with the way it's been. Right. And that you can get in bad equilibrium because you don't want to change it. It may right. be better to change it, right. things to evolve, but you don't want to because it's just transactions cost for you right. and you're just trying to connect people and give people services that they want. Right, and so, you know, um, I, I invest, I angel invest in a lot of startups and whenever I see a startup doing something non-standard on the deal docs, it's a huge red flag to me. Yeah. Where I want them to innovate, I want them to innovate on the product. You know, I want them to create a product people haven't seen before. Um, I want them to come up with maybe a distribution model for, you know, where I, I, when I see entrepreneurs trying to innovate on like how to set up a C-Corp, I'm like, okay, this is a problem. You know? yeah. uh, that, that's not what we're paying them to do yeah. or investing in them to do. 
So let's, uh, I'm be interested to hear uh, in, in your capacity as an angel investor. Have you, have you been watching Silicon Valley and HBO? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I imagine you as Peter Gregory there with the <laughs> seeds and the, the, the burger cake. So right. as you're sitting there uh, determining people's fates, um, uh, I guess I have two questions. I mean, what are you really looking for, mm -hmm. right? What's the thing that, you know, it's gotta be some idea, but are there th characteristics of the pitches of the people right. that you re that really excite you? And then tell us maybe a couple of things that you're involved in that you're really excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, the the thing that five years from now we're all going to look back on this talk and just be like, oh, he told us about that. That is right. really it's, I use it every day. Right. Um, yeah. So Silicon Valley. It's a little frustrating as a show because I feel like they get about sixty percent of it right, and then there's like these maddening details that are like I wish you. Know, yeah. They got, so like, there's a moment where Peter Gregory tells them, you know, it's like, I want to see, you know, he's got that weird like, <laughs> sort of staccato, I think it's supposed to be modeled after uh, my friend Peter Thiel, but it's not, it's not quite right. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, he's like, I want to see a business plan. I want to see three years of P&Ls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, okay, a seed investor who is giving you your first 200 grant doesn't care about any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. want to see your product. Okay, yeah. that's number one. P&Ls, who knows how this thing's going to sell. No one cares about that until a much later stage of, of investing. Um, so, you know, what gets me excited about investing in a company is um, it, it's either a product I use and love, or it's sort of, sort of on the product side or on the team side, um, it's a relationship I have with somebody who I think is, you know, really excellent entrepreneur. And, you know, I might not be a user myself, but I kind of trust that they're going to figure it out, you know? So, um, before we go to yeah. some of the ones you're excited yeah, about, yeah. so in your, uh, in your relationships mm -hmm. that you talk yeah. about people you trust, you right. have this network, Right. it's been called the PayPal Mafia, but it, yours is uh, <laughs> broader than that. There are people in your circle, Peter Thiel, who you went mm -hmm. to Stanford with, Antonio Gracias, who was a classmate of ours, right. Mark Woolway, who was a classmate of ours, and I'm sure there are others that I don't even know about. Mm -hmm. Working with friends and building these kind of networks, was this a conscious thing? Uh, did it just sort of happen organically? How do, you, how do you think about that network and managing those relationships? You know, I don't do business with my friends, right? right? I play ice hockey, we sit around and drink beers together. Right. So it's a kind of a strange thing for me to imagine, like, oh, I'd right. be worried about it. Right. Well, in the case of PayPal, we had to recruit our friends because no one else would work for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, literally. So, like, Peter recruited me. I recruited Mark. Uh, you know, Max Levchin was the CTO. He recruited his friends from U of I. We were all in our 20s. I, actually, when PayPal filed for an IPO, I was the median age of an executive on the S1. Like 29. And I was 30, 29. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, half the people were, were even younger than that. Um, and it actually worked out really well. Um, you know, the... Um, Companies that hire through headhunters and, and stuff like that, um, I think it tends to work a lot less well. I think um, it helps if you, because you know your, your friend's strengths and weaknesses, if they're sort of cut from the same cloth as you, you're more sort of culturally aligned. Um, so I tend to think it can work very well. Although obviously, you know, if it doesn't work, then you, know, you blow up not just a business, but yeah. friendship. So there's some risk there, but, but I, I, I tend to think it's a good idea. Uh, and so, uh, you know, a lesson mm -hmm. for uh, the students now is probably, you know, the friends you have, look to your right, look to your left, one of them right. could be, uh, or, or three of them could be uh, an important uh, a business contact later on. Well, yeah, Some, yeah, actually, I think this is like a super important point, is that um, the good people in Silicon Valley always get hired through their networks because the people in their network know their quality and want to snap them up as soon as they become available. So the idea that they're, it, it's rare that they ever go through like a headhunter or a recruiter or something like that. Um, if you think about it like it's an information problem, like, you know, no one knows, they know your resume, but everyone's got a good resume. So it's sort of like the people who know your quality the best are the ones who are going to be in your network. Yeah. Um, so you want to get a job through your network. I mean, and, and then you get like this huge, um, negative signal, if you're not getting hired through your network, well, why is that? Do the people who know you best think you're not very good? Yeah. 
Um, and so Silicon Valley tends to be like sort of tight knit that way. And um, you know, I think one of the things that is never very like clear when you're in school, but I can tell you is like super important in the work world, is the power of your reputation. <coughs> um, you know, it's other people's perception of uh, of your quality and you know how good a job you do. And um, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody has to like you or anything like that. It's you know, there's going to be people who are wrong about you and idiosyncratic views, but it's sort of just the overall, you know, um, dis collective view of, 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 of how good you are. And um, it's amazing how many opportunities your reputation will create for you. Or destroy for you, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I remember and this, this must be true if you're a lawyer or anything else. I, I think it's true everywhere. And I think, to, again, to our students, I mean, I, you know, I would say you always work for yourself and your career has already started. Because the relationships and the reputation you're building now uh, will stick with you uh, uh, probably a lot longer than you imagine. So uh, some, of the, some yeah. of the things you're involved in that you're excited about? Um, well, let's see. I mean, some, some of the companies that, um, that I've invested in, um, that some of the more late stage stuff. Um, well, th 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 there, there's some stuff that I did a while ago that, um, like Facebook and Twitter that have now, obviously everyone knows about. Um, so the, the companies now I'm, that I'm probably most excited about would be like Uber and um, Airbnb. And um, let's see, uh, Antonio you know, and I just did an investment in a company called Adapar, which is financial software. It's probably not something you guys are going to use as consumers, but um, if you ever work at like a finance firm one day, it's something that um, could, be, uh, could be important. Um, let's see, do you guys use a site called Quora? It's a question and answer site. Um, gosh, let's see. No, is there um, some animated? SpaceX. SpaceX. So SpaceX is a company that I... I invested in. Um, is there some animating vision that you have for the way the world should be that is lurking in the background of any of your investments? Or is it just like, I just want to make as much money as I possibly can? <laughs> um, Which I love. I mean, right. I'm all for that. So that's fine. I didn't mean that as an insult. Yeah. No, you, so you definitely want to make money. But uh, the problem is it's never clear what's going to make you money. So you have to use something else as the criteria. So. Um, so again, you know, my, my criteria just come down to, um, is this a product I use and love? So sorry, one other one I'm, I'll mention is Houz, H-O-U-Z-Z. -Z. Have you guys used this before? It's like a, an app for home remodeling and design. So if you ever get to the point where you want to remodel you know, somewhere you're, you're living, um, it'll be super helpful. Very, very bullish. But that was a product that I started using, loved it, and then went to the founders and asked if I could invest. Um, I think that's going to be like a... A gigantic company, but it'll probably take like five years. Um, so, so things that it, so so part of it's like the Warren Buffett Dairy Queen model, where he said, you know, like I invest in Dairy Queen because I, I eat there all the time, so I love the product, <laughs> right? That that I think is very sound. And then, uh, like I said, I think if the if the network is um, if 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 you really trust the the entrepreneur, so you know, SpaceX. Fundamentally, I invested in, in Elon Musk. Um, there's a, a company called Palantir that, um, that does, um, it's sort of a, a data mining tool, but sort of it does a lot of um, government security type stuff, um, which Peter Thiel sort of co-founded, so I invest in that. I mean, those are products I'm never going to use myself, but... Um, but the, SpaX, the, the you may use it. <laughs> I'm hoping. Go I got my fingers crossed for, um, in my lifetime. <laughs> So let me talk about uh, government right. for a second. Uh, and please, if you have questions, yeah. put up your hands. Um, uh, so when I was in San Francisco <laughs> recently, when I fly to the West Coast, I feel like Washington, D.C. is just, just not even really salient. It is just so far away geographically and mentally mm -hmm. to the way that people out there operate. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanna know, you know, in your experience, um, what are things the government, regulations, laws, that you've experienced as a serial entrepreneur mm -hmm. that are impediments or maybe huge helps. Uh, you know, I know you were a political animal before law school, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, you've now, you're not a political animal, but right. in your experience with, with government as an right. entrepreneur, what are, we, what are we getting right? What are we getting wrong? Right. You know, uh, what are the three, what is the three planks of the David Sachs for Congress <laughs> uh, stool? Um. Well, I think in general, when you're an entrepreneur, you really just want government out of your way. 
Um, I mean, it, it, it is sort of like the old, um, you know, Ronald Reagan thing about how uh, the scariest thing you can hear is, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, yeah. that sort of thing. <laughs> um, that being said, you know, Silicon Valley does have a wish list of things that we want to get fixed. So one is on immigration, the whole H-1B visa thing. So we don't have nearly enough programmers, you know, technical talent. I think uh, H-1B visas, they get distributed, like they, they get used up, each year's allocation gets used up in one week. So it's crazy. Uh, it'd be nice to see the whole immigration issue resolved, but specifically if we could at least, you know. Um, Shouldn't we just auction off uh, entry into the United States? We raise a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is like a, a really complica complicated one where, you know, I'm not gonna, I, I don't have the solution to like the whole, the whole problem, but I, I do think that, I mean, other people have said, if you go to a U U.S. university and you get like a technical degree, we should at least stamp a, a visa to your diploma yeah. so you can stay here and work. It's yeah. kind of crazy that we're sending all this talent back to, um, to other, other countries. That'd be very helpful. Um, another one is um, the sort of epidemic of like patent lawsuits where, you know, patents were supposed to help innovators. They don't. I mean, it's sort of, um, you know, we have this whole epidemic of patent trolls now who are people who've never really created anything. But um, except for maybe you know patent filings, and um, you know I think there should at a minimum be a requirement that you build something in order to get a patent on it, um, and you probably shouldn't be able to patent features of a, of a software program. Um, you know your code is protected by copyright anyway, so um, you know copying features is something that has always been part of our industry, right? Some you know. Some competitive product comes out with an idea, you're in an arms race, right? You gotta copy it, they're onto the next thing. That's all very, very good for consumers. So this whole raft of, of patent litigation is very, very bad. Um, and I think we'd like to see that fixed. Um, and then I think there's a, a third new emerging thing, which is um, I'm noticing that, um, that the old economy now is starting to use government to fight back against the disruption caused by the, so um, for instance, you've Uber's got Uber, yeah, yeah. where the taxi cab commissions, which were really in, created because taxis were so bad, so deceptive, you know, but now as a result of regulatory capture, the taxi industry is using the commissions to try and, you know, stifle Uber. Same thing with Airbnb and all the hotel commissions. And then, you know, the state of New Jersey now says that Tesla cannot sell uh, cars directly to consumers in their state. Uh, and again, this is because of, uh, you know, the, um, the, uh, the, um, car, the, car, yeah, yeah. The, the car dealer networks have a lot of political clout. So, you know, it's really perverse that, again, the reason why we have regulations in these areas is because these industries were using unsavory practices in the first, I mean, who likes taxis? Uh, who likes, um, you know, car salesmen? I mean, these are like, you know, <laughs> and yet we're allowing them to kind of now dictate uh, policy. So I think, you know, I, I don't know how, if there's like some systemic way to fix that. I, I ultimately think that the new economy will win because consumers are on our side. Yeah. When the, I think when they threatened to do things in Chicago with Uber, they right. Alderman heard from, from lots of people. So uh, let's hear from some right. people. Uh, qu questions, yes, please. Yeah, um, so to what extent is like the, it's kind of a drift off to that, to what extent like, is the regulatory and political debt stacked against entrepreneurs in favor of these more entrenched interests, politically connected chamber of commerce types? And what specifically can we do about that? But, you know, I mean, the Uber example is a good example, but you mean more concrete steps or how we can fix that in the level playing field? Yeah, so the question right. just for the, yeah. for the sound is, uh, there is no real lobby for uh, capitalism. There is only a lobby for business, and business right. and capitalism are not the same thing. Right, right. Solve that problem. <laughs> you have 30 <laughs> seconds. Go. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. There, there's, there's, no, there's, there, there's no lobbyist in Washington for the business that doesn't exist yet. And that is a huge problem. Um, and, uh, you know, this is why, you know, I think one of the problems with the Republican Party, to the extent they're supposed to be the lobby for, for, for business, is it's, they're, they're more like the lobby for entrenched, like existing business interests as yeah. opposed to businesses that might exist in the future. Because, you know, businesses that don't exist can't make donations. So, 
Um, I agree it's a big problem. I don't have that solution, but I guess what I can tell you as an entrepreneur is you just need to put all that out of your mind and ignore it. And because the good news is they don't come after you until you achieve some level of success. It's kind of like Reggie Jackson said, they don't boo nobodies. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, like Uber, the reason why they're coming after Uber is because Uber is, you know, beating the crap out of the, you know, yellow cab industry. And it's hard to see how, so taxis are fighting for their lives right now. Um, as an entrepreneur, your goal is to create a product that can be that disruptive, but no one's gonna pay attention to you in the early days. Like, no one's even gonna believe that you're gonna be successful. So, um, you know, I can tell you like with um, PayPal, um, there were all sorts of rules that PayPal was supposedly violating. This was the, the, the there were a lot of rationalizations by banks or even eBay why they didn't create PayPal. And what they've said is, well, you know, PayPal was flouting all sorts of regulations that, you know, that we didn't want to risk violating. And, um, and we just didn't even know that they existed. So, like, we just, you know, like, had we known more about the payments industry, it might have been a problem, but we didn't even know, like, these, these things. Um, I, I don't actually think we were violating anything. I think what happens is that technology comes along, disruption comes along, and creates new situations that it's like just very unclear like how these old regimes apply to these new situations and so um, and so you know PayPal I think in the early days was operating in this gray area of Visa MasterCard regulations in this gray area of money transmitter rules and um, you know we had lawyers they looked at it and said we think it's probably okay you know but, but what really happens is, if you're successful and consumers like you, you usually win the right to then go back and, um, and so in the case of PayPal, we went and got all those money transmitter licenses. We didn't think we needed them initially, but then eventually we got enough scale, and we're like, let's just go get them. So same thing with Uber, like where you know, now they've got enough scale that they can fight back. And so I tend to think like in the early days, just don't even worry about that stuff. Just worry about creating a great product. Please. Do you have um, top five inspirations who pushed you to be where you are right now? Who are your, uh, who are your heroes? Heroes? Um, gosh. Um, you know, it's, um, well, the, the one that I think is kind of universal in Silicon Valley is Steve Jobs. You know, um, he's sort of the one who um, created um, the, I don't know, the, the des design aesthetic, or it's, it's sort of the, um, the emphasis on making products um, intuitive. Um, he's basically the way, he, he's the person who really invented the way that, can, that computers and humans interface with each other. Um, so that's one that's just like absolutely universal. I mean, like, I don't know if there's a statue of him in Silicon Valley, but there probably should be. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of people who I've worked with who, um, you know, who I've learned a lot from. So, you know, like Elon Musk, um, Peter Thiel, uh, you know, Max Levchin. Like, I was really fortunate to work with these other great entrepreneurs, and um, I feel like I've picked up things along the way from, from each of them. Is, is Silicon Valley still the only place to be, or are there other cities now, or does it even matter where you are when you're trying to launch a startup? So uh, what about 1871 and Chicago? Uh, that's the question is, you know, should everybody just, if you're interested in this stuff, go to Silicon Valley or can you make it happen in Savannah, Georgia or Chicago or New York? What's, what's 1871? This is the Chicago uh, seed startup. Oh, I see. Uh, Grassis is involved. You got to ask. Oh, okay. It's our attempt right. to be the uh, right. Silicon <laughs> Prairie, I think right. is the... Uh, so wh what I would say is that um, tech is a rising tide everywhere. And you're seeing successful tech companies sprout up, you know, everywhere. So you know, Chicago's had a few successes. There's like Groupon. There's, I guess, Braintree. Uh, um, and New York's had some, and LA's had some now. Um, but Silicon Valley is the biggest. And um, I tend to think you can start an idea anywhere because now the costs of starting something have come down so much. But Silicon Valley is the easiest and best place to scale a company. 
So, you know, we actually started Yammer in LA um, because it's where I happened to be after I made the movie. And um, about a year into it, I woke up one day, we were about 15 employees, and it was starting to catch on. And I woke up one day and said, wait, why are we in LA? And this is kind of like a legacy condition. And so about a month later, we moved the whole team up to Silicon Valley. And what we found, is, and we, we scaled much more rapidly as a result. We were able to raise more money because all the VCs are there, uh, or a lot more VCs are there. We were able to get more uh, industry exposure, press, and I'd say most of all, um, access to a deeper and wider talent pool. So um, you never know exactly what the long tail of skills you're going to need uh, as a business are. I mean, when you start something, you only need a handful of people. You need you know, a web design person, you need like a back-end engineering person, and somebody who has like a business vision. And they can even be, all three of those things can be the same person, like Mark Zuckerberg, or it could be a handful of people. But once a business starts to grow, you need to bring in a lot more people. So we figured out well, we need to have enterprise sales. There really weren't many enterprise sales companies in LA, um, whereas by moving to San Francisco, Salesforce was down the street. We were able to basically poach a bunch of salespeople from Salesforce. And that experience selling cloud products, they knew how to rebut um, fears that enterprises expressed to us about, well, how can we trust our data with you, that sort of thing. And then we realized, wait a second, we need, um, if we're gonna have salespeople, we need lead gen experts. Uh, we got to a certain size, and then we needed um, experts in database scalability. So this really, Silicon Valley has this amazing talent pool where you can find any skill you need, and I think it's just harder everywhere else. And so- Which um, is amazing in light yeah. of the fact that you know, we think of the world today as so global, so interconnected, right. so easy to be anywhere. Right. And yet, geography still really matters. And you just, mm -hmm. you know, Wall Street, Chicago Board of Trade, and, and commodities dealers, Silicon Valley, I mean, they're mm -hmm. just very powerful examples of being down the street really uh, matters a lot. Yeah, network density is important. And I, I'll, I'll give you one other example. So the last uh, financing round that Amber did before we got acquired, we raised something like $85 million. It was our biggest financing round, and we did it in about two weeks. Um, I don't think that can happen anywhere else in the world. I mean, certainly in Hollywood, people would be worried they're just going to steal the money and run off with it to like <laughs> Jamaica or something. Um, the reason why it could happen so fast in Silicon Valley is because all the new investors knew our old investors who are on our board, and all they got to do is call these guys up, and they have like decades of experience working with these people, and just say, hey, is David telling us the truth? Are these numbers, you know, are the numbers that he's sharing with us, is this what you've seen on the board the last few years? And so the trust that you build up in a dense network like that is enormous. And I think that's the thing that like, you know, Russia tried to create um, its own um, Silicon Valley, where they, um, they basically tried to relocate, they, you know, they kind of around some universities, they tried to deposit some like VC, you know, venture capitalists and some entrepreneurs and technical talent, and it never took off. Because none of the people knew each other or trusted each other. And um, so it turned out to be kind of like a Potemkin Silicon Valley. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, but that's really important too. Now, we're starting to see these little ecosystems pop up in places like Chicago and New York and LA. So I'm not saying you have to move. I think you can do stuff in other places, but I'm still, I, I still think Silicon Valley is like, you know, the major leagues. Please. Uh, do you have any advice for people who are not take experts like lawyers, but who don't want to miss this wave of uh, tech startups? In particular, like you have an idea to create an internet company, but you have you're not a programmer. You have to hire or partner with another programmer. How do you control and avoid the situation like in Facebook, the like initial partner get kicked out by the like tech persons? Well, you know, Facebook's founding story is very unusual in a lot of ways. And um, there's sort of like a lot of um, college hijinks involved because they're all college students. I think that one was sort of like unusual. Um, I think it's okay in a startup to not be technical, um, but then you have to partner with somebody who is. And so um, there's a lot of examples of founding teams where it's like sort of a business person and a technical person or it's a product person and a sales person, like, um, like those types of combinations work quite well. Um, I, uh, 
I think finding that person is difficult. I think you kind of have to be plugged into, it helps you plugged into a network because it's going to work a lot better if you guys already have some history working together. You know, just um, creating a company with somebody, it's a little bit like a, a marriage. And um, so obviously it helps if you've like dated for a while. <laughs> yeah. What is your next thing? You've done Yammer, it's, right. it's sold. Are you sticking with Microsoft? Are you doing, uh, what, what is the, the next dream? Yes. Um, Five years from now, where, yeah. where will you be? I'm, I'm still, I'm still uh, mulling over what, what I want to do next. Um, the, um, the problem with the second startup is a hard one, and um, the problem with the third startup is maybe even harder. But, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if I, if I do another one or um, whether I just try to help companies that I think are exciting. And, you know, you typically do that by being, you know, a, like kind of an angel investor. To follow up on an earlier question, why don't VCs lobby in Washington on behalf of entrepreneurial interests? And also, do you think uh, startup tanks like Singularity University and, and others like that could play a role being like the voice of entrepreneurs? Uh, well, there are industry groups, uh, but they tend to be um, they they tend to be funded um, by the big tech companies. Um, who do, I'd say, an okay job, uh, or a pretty good job representing Silicon Valley, although, you know, a big tech company with, you know, thousands of patents is not going to argue for abolishing software patents. They're, you know, but they're, they're still going to want to rein in patent trolls, so you'll kind of get, like, second best solutions. I just think, um, you know, why don't VCs do it? I mean, first of all, the VC industry is pretty small. Like, there aren't that many people doing it. I mean, there's maybe... Um, I mean, there's less than 100 VC firms that matter. I, I'd say there's probably less than 100 VC firms that are actively investing. Um, and so there might be, you know, 500 people who truly matter in the entire industry. Um, and they're focused on finding companies. It's just, you know, it's one of these problems where, um, uh, with all special interests, where the harms are really diffuse, but the benefits to a specific interest are really concentrated and so like Ooh. no one person really has the incentive to go fix it. Do you think the incentives of the VC community are aligned with uh, the social interest in the following sense? Uh, a criticism you could level at Silicon Valley is you've got all this enormous amount of talent mm -hmm. and money and it's chasing the next way that I can just do this more mm -hmm. uh, instead of you know I don't know finding things that are you know, cures for cancer or real mm -hmm. social problems that are crying out for, you know, uh, the, the next app that makes right. my life a little bit easier is maybe not worth the uh, attention that it gets from people like you. What's your response right. to that? Well, a lot of people have said that recently, that Silicon Valley seems to be doing small incremental things, um, you know, the next Snapchat or as opposed to like big things. Yeah. And, um, I think there's some truth to it in this sense, which is venture capital is really milestone-based investing. And so the way it works is, it's very efficient. The way it works is you, you have an idea, you have a team, maybe you have a product prototype, you go out, you raise a million dollars from angels. Um, with that, you go get some initial customers. You prove that there's demand. Now you can go do a Series A from a VC firm, maybe you raise $5 million. Then you, know, you try to get to the next step of proof. And that might mean you get to a million dollars a year in revenue or something like that. And now you can raise $10 million and do a Series B. And so you're always looking to get proof, enough proof to raise the next round of capital. And if things are going well, your valuation is also increasing. So it's very efficient for everybody. It's very efficient for capital because you don't plow a lot of capital into things that don't work. It's efficient for the entrepreneurs because you don't get diluted uh, excessively because, yes, you're taking on more and more money and you're giving the investor shares, but your valuation is going up. So it's a very efficient system for companies that can show steady, that can show milestones. Now, the way I interpret the question is that sort of the cure for cancer is that there are no milestones, you know, that it's basically zero to one. And there aren't many 
firms that have the appetite or the capital to write a billion dollar check. Mm. Or you know, to take a billion dollar risk on something that may or may not work. So you know, only certain types of investments fit the VC model. You have to be able to chunk down what you want to accomplish into discrete steps where you can de-risk it at every step. Mm. Interesting. Okay, we have time yeah. for one more question. Yeah, please. Yeah, so early in your career, uh, I'm interested to know what was the thought process that you had in determining what kind of risk uh, would be a good risk for you to, to take a chance on? Mm -hmm. So, you know, with PayPal, you know, I just thought the idea of email, emailing money was a really killer idea. In the case of Yammer, the idea was corporate social networking. You know, I just, um, I saw what was happening on the consumer side with Facebook and MySpace, and I thought that I, I saw that the logical uh, conclusion of that trend was that everybody would have a social networking account. It seems obvious today, but this was when maybe like 10 million people were using social networking. And the next step, once everyone was using it in their personal lives, was they'd want to use some version of it at work. And so we could take that communication technique and make it, um, we could use it for business collaboration. Um, so, you know, can I sort of, I, can I distill down what I, what I think is a good idea? It's, it's hard. I mean, somehow oh, I just, I feel like you've got to be a few years ahead of, you, you have to be like, you know, it's the old Gretzky thing about skiing to where the puck is going. It's got to be um, an idea that um, you think is likely to happen in, say, the next four years, but beyond that, it's too early, and then... If it's something that's happening right now, it's also too late. So it's this like, really weird thing of calibrating. You don't want to be too early or too late. So by the time everyone is doing it or talking about it, it's way too late. So don't do anything that's considered like a hot space. Like that's just, never do that. Uh, you know, when we did PayPal, no one wanted to do payments. And when we were doing Yammer, no one wanted to do enterprise. And now payments is a hot space and enterprise or consumerization of enterprise is a hot space. So I would just try to find things that are not um, that are not being chased by everybody that are somehow not hot, but yet they could happen in the next four or five years. It can't be like 20 years away. That's our last word. I want yeah. you to, to please join me in thanking David. This was uh, both uh, highly informational and inspiring, I thought. Uh, so uh, please uh, thank him for coming. Yeah,